All rise. The Court of Appeals Division One is now in session. Good morning. Good morning. Please be seated. This is the time set for argument in Pine Top Lakes Association versus Ponderosa Domestic Water Improvement District. Our civil number 18-0140. Um, each side will have 20 minutes within which to present their arguments. Uh, appellant may reserve some portion of that for rebuttal. It's up to you to keep track of your time in that regard. We have um, read the briefs. We've uh, been through the record. We've conferenced the case. So we're pretty familiar with this uh, fairly longstanding legal dispute, parts of it at least. Uh, so keep that in mind as you make your arguments here today. We're recording the proceedings, both audio and video. Uh, so as you approach the podium, please identify yourself and your clients uh, for us. With that, uh, follow me or see. <clears throat> Thank you, and may it please the court, my name is Joshua Carden, here on behalf of Appellant Ponderosa Domestic Water Improvement District. In the waning hours of the Bush administration, the Pine Top Lakes Homeowners Association filed a breach of contract case that we are now bringing uh, one last time, I hope, for uh, this, this appeal. Um, in September of 2012, my co-counsel, Douglas Zimmerman, who is the lead trial counsel in this matter, uh, served an offer of judgment under Rule 68 uh, to allow the association to take judgment on its breach of contract claims for $500. And uh, fast forward four and five years later, those breach of con that breach of contract case in particular uh, went away. It was finally ruled that the association lacked the ability to bring the breach of contract case, that the uh, association was going to recover nothing on its breach of contract case. And in deciding the application for attorney's fees filed just as to that case, not as to the consolidated but separate con condemnation matter, um, the trial court judge said, no, Water District, you are not the prevailing party. And in this particular situation, that's really the error that, that brought us here. Under both the statute and the Civil Procedure Rule 68, the trial court lacked the discretion at that point, uh, according to the Supreme Court's decision in American Power Products, to make that determination. And if there is any error that uh, should be de you know, determined as a matter of law, it's, it's that one, that under any legal test that these uh, courts use in Arizona for determining who is a prevailing party, my client was the prevailing party below. The association received no uh, benefit from bringing its breach of contract claim. The theories that it advanced were rejected uh, not at the trial court, but at this court level, at, at every turn, and at the end of the day, the uh, trial court should have made the determination that my client was the prevailing party to uh, below. Even under those circumstances, though, isn't there discretion and isn't the Superior Court free to not award attorney's fees to your client? The, the trial court is free to use its discretion in the context of 12 341 I have no disagreement with that argument. I don't think the trial court gets to decide as a matter of law that my client was not the prevailing party. And the reason for that is stated, again, as um, American Power Products, the Supreme Court very clearly says, Rule 68 has changed the game. Rule 68 has narrowed the discretion of the trial court to say who the prevailing party was. The, whether you're using the, uh, the net benefit test or the totality of the litigation sense, regardless of how you slice it, the association did not prevail on its breach of contract claim. The finding that the trial court made that seemed to dictate why it felt that, pun that my client was not the prevailing party was this idea that somehow the contract case got you know, intertwined, I think the wording was, with the condemnation case in the contract case. So if, if there's, let's say, a reversal of that finding and, and uh, you are the prevailing party as determined by this court, that still doesn't 
get you to the attorney's fees, at least not directly. Correct, correct. But it, it, that, that error was the, uh, the root of the tree, so to speak. You chop off that root, and then you have to start over and say, okay, now that Ponderosa is the prevailing party, what are you going to do with that information as opposed to the finding, well, as a threshold matter, oh, I find the Water Improvement District is not the prevailing party. Well, under, you know, under no circumstances is my client going to get fees with that as the foundation. But to, to have that be the conclusion, the first stated conclusion, means that everything that follows is essentially tainted, uh, you know, fruit of the poisonous tree, as it were. Is there no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So I, I'm, I'm re trying to recall the, the, the judge's ruling. It seemed to be rather extensive, reciting the reasons why he thought the actions of the uh, Homeowners Association were reasonable under the, the circumstances. Can we inf Infer from from that that he would use those same reasons to exercise discretion in not awarding fees. I think that would be I think that'd be a dangerous inference for a lot of reasons. The the he he does not analyze the factors from the statute. He simply literally the one fact that he finds. Well, I take that back. There's two. The first one is that the two actions got intertwined which I think is legally incorrect on its on its face but but and then the second factor was this idea that the water improvement district's owner had bought the lot surreptitiously never intending to to follow the CCNRs and and even that factor I think is a is a false would be a false inference to draw because that's it's it's that's not illegal that's that's not inappropriate uh, the water district didn't condemn somebody's house and bulldoze it to put their well there it bought a vacant lot in order to put its well there and to to say that well clearly the judge is not going to award attorney's fees in your uh, in your client's favor, I think stands the argument on its head, and, and it's it, it's not really a precedent that we would want to, want to see as litigants to be able to say, well, we can tell ahead of time this judge isn't going to give your client any fees, so we're just going to go ahead and let that legal error stand. In this particular case, we think that the standard that the Supreme Court enunciated in American Power Products is too important to just to let set and go by when the court has said your discretion is now narrowed. You have to look at the Rule 68 offer and judgment. In this particular case, the ruling doesn't even mention it. But, it, but is that the same? Is is it the same to say we are inferring what the court uh, would do on remand? Um, that's the same in your estimation than to say, uh, even though uh, Pine Top, or I'm sorry, Ponderosa was the prevailing party, there were sufficient findings uh, that support no award of attorney's fees. I mean, is that is that the same? I I don't think it's quite the same. But again, the only the only three things the court says about its analysis after saying Ponderosa is not the prevailing party is the case has got intertwined. I've looked at the factors, and in my discretion, I deny under twelve three forty one oh one, and the uh, water district owner bought the bought the lot apparently never intending to comply with the CCRs Th that's it from the ruling as I recall in terms of he goes into saying this is a uh, this is a, a, a unique contract case or this is a, a this is a blown out of all proportion I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with the exact words forgive me judge Cruz but it's it's something to the effect of this is hardly a simple contract case and the only reasons it's not a simple contract case is because the association kept doing strange things to make it not a simple contract case. But, but the factors the judge referred to are the, are, are the factors that uh, a court should look at in determining whether to exercise its discretion as to award fees. Agreed. Agreed. And that and that's the difficulty. So in, in bringing this case to this court, we're looking at, yes, this is an abuse of discretion standard when deciding how much fees to award, how to go about it, and all those things, except you don't get to start with the false conclusion that says, oh, by the way, you, Water District, were not the prevailing party when every ruling ultimately went in the association, uh, in the Water District's favor. I, I can see that argument if the court had stopped 
with that, as you say, uh, uh, that false premise. Right. But you go on and, and analyze the applicability of awarding fees under the uh, under that case, associated indemnity court. Cuts against your argument. It, it, it does, but only in the sense that the, the discretion is to be exercised within the framework of Rule 68 and 12341.01. Both of the, both the rule and the statute deal with what are you, you know, you're supposed to consider prior settlement offers in deciding who the prevailing party is. And I think that fundamentally flawed the analysis so, so badly that it will, if allowed to stand essentially as it sits, could we end up going back on remand and getting nothing for our fees? Of course. That's, I mean, that, I'm, I'm, I'm recognizing that's what the abuse of discretion allows for in 12341. But to, to let the legal error stand is going to serve as a huge deterrent to people who are defending against non-meritorious claims and who are doing so because it's, it, you know, we, we're doing this very narrow thing over here. We're condemning one section of the CCNRs to allow water and we're doing that against the very few lot owners who haven't consented to put a water well there. This is not a paper mill. <laughs> this is something that's going to supply water to the neighborhood and to allow that legal error to stand is going to frustrate the entire purpose of Rule 68 and 1234101. Is the discretion there? Yes, it is. On remand, that, that discretion will still live on. I don't see a ruling from this court as disturbing the ability of the trial court to exercise its discretion. I do see it as a necessary correction to a fundamental legal error that we had in this particular order uh, that necessitated this appeal. Um, we'll reserve a little time for rebuttal unless the court has any more questions of right now. Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court, Sterling Solomon on behalf of Pine Top Lakes Association today. Um, Quite clearly, the trial court did not lack discretion when it determined that the water district was not the prevailing party. Uh, they, uh, the trial court has the freedom and the discretion to uh, make these findings and did so in an order that clearly spelled out why uh, these findings were made and hence why in its discretion the attorney's fees for the water district were denied. Uh, to the contrary, if anything, the attorney's fees for the uh, HOA, Pine Top Lakes, should have been awarded uh, under the circumstances. Uh, this is a very unique case, as my opposing counsel has indicated. Um, the uniqueness of that case may come from the fact, as he indicated, that there, there were several cases, uh, but they were not improperly consolidated. And in fact, uh, the unique facts of the case are what uh, led to the ruling uh, of the uh, trial, co trial court. Um, to be very clear, the association has a duty to maintain compliance with the CCRs. Uh, case law in Arizona is quite clear on that under both Johnson v. Point Community Association uh, from this court in 2003 and again in Tierra Ranchos Homeowners Association from this court in 2007. Uh, we learned from these cases that community associations have a clear duty to treat the various members fairly and a duty to reasonably enforce the powers, uh, to use their enforcement powers to ensure fair treatment of the members. That's precisely going back to the waning hours of the Bush administration, as my opposing counsel has indicated. What happened here? The water district simply purchased a lot, lot 27 in the association, and actually asked for a variance from the association to be able to put a well on that lot, and that variance was denied. Nonetheless, they went ahead and built a well, drilled and built a well on that lot, and proceeded and the homeowners association was left with no choice but to enforce its CCNRs by filing a breach of contract. 
claim. That breach of contract claim is what prompted then the water district to go through the proper statutory uh, remedies that it has available in condemning using the theory of eminent domain to put a well on that lot. It took years as the court record indicates and as uh, uh, the court has indicated today and we don't need to go into the the long battle that uh, ensued there but to, to make it very clear the association had no choice. It was between a rock and a hard place so to speak. The members had a, a right to uh, seek enforcement of the CCNRs had the association not filed the breach of contract claim and the uh, um, uh, the association had no choice then but to file that breach of contract claim in moving forward with the the litigation uh, the Analyzation of whether the applicability of awarding attorney's fees, you know, cuts directly against the water district's argument. I believe that is true. Uh, the court has discretion to make findings, uh, to make findings based on uh, the evidence that's presented to the court and based on the, the case law that controls uh, how that evidence is considered by the trial court. In fact, under uh, the abuse of discretion uh, cases that uh, have been cited here in Schickner versus Schickner, the court can reach a conclusion without considering the evidence or uh, the record fails to provide substantial evidence to support the trial court's finding. That's not the case here. There was substantial evidence and the trial court included that uh, substantial evidence in its order. Uh, reading directly from the order, it states, the court denies the request for attorney's fees and costs presented by Ponderosa Domestic Water Improvement District based on an analysis of 12341 and 123401. The court finds that this is not a simple contract action. The Improvement District is not the prevailing party under statute, and even if it were considered the prevailing party, the factors in the statute above require a finding that Pine Top or the Water District uh, should not, or Pine Top Lakes Association, the HOA, should not be required to pay attorney's fees. Uh, part of the reasoning that the trial court stated for that was that Pine Top presented a meritorious claim or defense. The HOA did present a meritorious claim. Uh, uh, the, we asserted uh, a claim that Ponderosa was in breach of the CCRs, and that was a meritorious claim. It was something that not only was meritorious, but under the case law, I've cited previously both uh, um, Tierra, Tierra Ranchos and Johnson v. Point, uh, both uh, of those cases indicate it. Try, the uh, association actually had a mandate uh, to enforce its, its uh, CCNRs and therefore the breach of contract claim was meritorious and the court had complete discretion uh, to deny uh, attorney's fees to the water district and on the, on the basis that it was not the prevailing party in the case. That said, um, <clears throat> because a, a finding was made in the case that the water district was exempt, um, this was not a declaration of a victor in the, in the breach of contract case. This was uh, a declaration of a victor in the um, condemnation case, which was, uh, like I say, combined uh, or consolidated with the breach of contract case. But that can be broken apart from and should be broken apart from um, the, uh, the condemnation case because in at least the analysis of whether or not uh, the water district was the prevailing party. Um, again, uh, the water district's uh, purchase of lot 27 and uh, eventual um, building and drilling of a well on that lot um, constituted a violation of the CCRs. And then and only then, um, uh, after the association had sued the water district for doing so, um, did the uh, did the water district then approach the uh, uh, condemnation through the power of eminent domain? Uh, this approach by the district means several things. The district did not follow the proper procedures to condemn 
property for governmental purpose at the outset of the litigation, and it was the association who had to first bring the legal action for a breach of contract that only forced them into uh, bringing that condemnation action. Uh, but for the district's erroneous actions, not going through condemnation in the first place, the association would not have incurred any attorney's fees in the enforcement of its CCNRs. Uh, the, the clear mandate of the actual declaration um, reads, should it become necessary at any time uh, that anyone authorized by the declaration to enforce the same employ counsel to enforce any of the provisions, conditions, restrictions, or covenants herein contained, all costs incurred in the enforcement of such covenants, conditions, or restrictions herein contained, including but not limited to a reasonable fee for counsel, shall be paid by the owner of a lot or lots who through their breach make it necessary for the association to enforce such covenants, conditions, or restrictions herein contained. The association had a duty not only under case law, but had a duty in the declaration of the CCRs itself to bring the breach of contract claim and that uh, declaration provides for the award of attorney's fees to the association rather than the water district. Um, again, the district through their breach made it necessary for the HOA to employ legal counsel and enforce the CCRs to ensure compliance with the same. And the district knowingly violated the CCRs. We know that because they approached the association asking for a variance, which was eventually denied. Mr. Solomon, it, it, it sounds to me like you're really arguing that the trial court erred in denying your request for fees. It did, well, Your Honor. You didn't appeal. We did, Your Honor, and that's that's a, a part of what uh, we're here for today as far as the, the appeal that the Water District has requested. Um, uh, Your Honor, that is something that the trial court had absolute discretion uh, to deny, and we believe that this court has the discretion to remand and uh, direct for an award of attorney's fees to the association. No, Your Honor. Thank you. Just a couple of things on rebuttal, Your Honor. The idea that the breach of contract case forced my client into filing its condemnation action, I think we've we've briefed fairly specifically that uh, there was a three-day gap in the filing. The association's breach of contract com uh, complaint has several exhibits referencing their knowledge of the condemnation proceedings underway. The only thing that hadn't happened yet was the filing of the lawsuit. It is not the filing of the breach of contract case that we are arguing should entitle us uh, to being prevailing parties and entitled to fees and all those things. At the point in time in which this court said in 2010, yes, Ponderosa does not have to comply with those restrictions in order to drill a test well, in order to go through its condemnation proceedings, the association should have stopped trying to sue for breach of contract. At that point, that, that should have been the end of it. It should have been a reminder in 2012 when my co-counsel served the offer of judgment. It should have, at every turn, when the when it became obvious that my client as a water improvement district had the ability to condemn the small portion of the CCNRs that it needed to, to put a water well in this neighborhood, that should have ended things. So in the judge's specific findings, when, when he says, the Pine Top presented a meritorious claim. It, they didn't produce a, a, a frivolous claim necessarily when they filed their breach of contract claim, but they litigated it for nine more years before it got to the point where the trial court said no more uh, and the attorney's fees are not going to be awarded. It was the it was the excessive litigation in this particular case. In regard to settlement, the judge below said the parties seem to be speaking a foreign language to each other. No, we served a Rule 68 offer of judgment in 2012 and either the judge didn't like the fact that we did that or, or something, but even the analysis of the factors don't reveal 
that the judge properly exercised his discretion. In the record, in the reporter's record, from the hearing on this, we've cited, I've included in the appendix, page 53 and page 71 from the reporter's record, where the judge says out loud, and Mr. Solomon even agreed that my client prevailed in the breach of contract case, and that the offer of judgment was, quote, relevant. That's in the actual, from the actual attorney's fees hearing. And so to go from that to get the order that doesn't mention the offer of judgment and does not find my client as the prevailing party, again, we believe warrants reversal. Uh, it may be an academic thing, but at this, the, the, here we are at the appeals court. This is the place where those academic things have to get resolved to provide guidance for all of us uh, litigators out there trying to apply the rules properly, trying to follow the procedural rules, trying to use the tools that the that the courts and and the and the legislature have put in place for us to incentivize people to resolve disputes. That's what that's what the Supreme Court talked about in American Power Products. That's what the factors are for. Is the discretion vanish? No, it does not vanish. But we would respectfully ask that this court reverse the findings of the trial court as to the prevailing party status and, and to give due consideration to the factors in light of the requirements of 12-341-01 and Rule 68. Here's part of the, of the problem. That I that I see when you look at our standard of review of abuse of discretion, um, we're looking at whether there's any reasonable basis to uphold uh, that order. Any reasonable basis? Can we really say that there is no reasonable basis at all under which an, uh, a zero award was justified? I'm not even asking quite for that, Judge Cruz. It's it's not that there was any reasonable basis to justify no award. The court, this court has to retain some degree of review power for it to even be an abuse of discretion standard. If it's not, it's just uh, it's a never disturbed ruling. Uh, and so what do we look at in, in, in our standard review section? We look at, did the court make an error of law in reaching a discretionary conclusion? As soon as that happened, that is an abuse of discretion. That is exactly what happened. There was no discretion for the trial court because of the what the Supreme Court recognized was the narrowing of the discretion through Rule 68. You cannot look at the procedural record, the Rule 68 offer and the various tests uh, for determining who the prevailing party was and come to that conclusion. So you don't, my sense of the court's order was it was making a, a findings in the alternative. In other words, let's assume for a second that your argument's right. The judge made a mistake in, in declaring that your client was not the prevailing party. The court then says essentially, but in the alternative, if in fact uh, you were the prevailing party, and we look at this issue then under the statute and the factors and associated indemnity, I exercise my discretion in not not awarding fees, and here's why. Why is that not sufficient? Because it's advisory at that point, I, at some level. It, it it's it that's that's like the emergency backup argument to say, uh, well, I mean, he actually says, even if Ponderosa were were found to be the prevailing party, that's you're right. He does word it in the alternative, so that is a cursory look at the factors, they're not accurate in the way that they're stated. It, again, once again, it's 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 got to be more than, than Pine Top presented a meritorious claim or defense. They're, they they filed a breach of contract suit that early in this long litigation was deemed to be completely out of bounds. You cannot bring a breach of contract action against the water improvement district, they have the right to do their test well. There has been no breach of contract. That's been the first third of this litigation, they find the answer to that. So pressing forward at that point with a non-meritorious claim or defense, I, again, I think that to decide as that it was meritorious, I think is even a question of, of law that this court can look at. To say that, that the settlement factor, the settlement factor has scarcely any analysis. 
uh, to, so to say that the trial court analyzed that factor, I think, is reading too much into the order and inferring things that aren't there. Uh, to say that the award would work in extreme hardship, there's no reference to what the hardship would be in the record. The association paid $650,000 to its own attorneys, as explained in the uh, attachments that it included in its newsletters. It doesn't say why it would be a hardship or how it would be a hardship. It again repeats the fact Ponderosa did not succeed on all claims and the two actions became inter intertwined. He, he repeats the non-prevailing party, saying that the, the legal question was novel. It, it wasn't novel. That's why this court granted special action repeatedly and clearly said, hey, this is Water Improvement District. It's a government body. It has condemnation authority. It gets to exercise its exploratory activity rights under the statute all the way through even in the analysis of those factors. I think the, the trial court gives short shrift to those factors because it's essentially advisory at that point. He's already decided that my client's not the prevailing party. So that's, at the end of the day, Your Honor, that's why we believe this case warrants a, a remand. Uh, Mr. Solomon did not file a cross appeal on behalf of his client, and so we believe he's not entitled to fees uh, on this appeal or, or in the court below, uh, but uh, that's, that's all I have unless there are further questions. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you very much. We appreciate the uh, briefing and arguments uh, presented by both sides here today. We'll take this under advisement, issue a written decision in due course. We're going to take a brief recess to allow counsel for the next case to come forward and get set up for the next argument. Thank you.